Coming up on Theater All the Moving Parts, a conversation with someone who thinks on his feet brilliantly, choreographer Sergio Trujillo. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Theater, All the Moving Parts. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco, at West Bank Cafe on Manhattan's Theater Row, directing the spotlight to those who help create the worlds of wonder we call the theater. Today's guest is Sergio Trujillo, a choreographer celebrated for his stunning talent in matching steps to character and story in such musicals as Jersey Boys, Memphis, On Your Feet, and Ain't Too Proud, for which he won the Tony Award. Welcome, Sergio, to Theater All the Moving Parts, and congratulations on a really well-deserved Tony Award. Thank you, thank you. I'm so, so happy to be sitting here with you. It's great to sit here with you as well. You. An interesting biographical fact about you that not a lot of people don't know is that you actually have a bachelor degree in science from the University of Toronto. What does ta science have to do with dance? I took a, 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 different, a different route to get to dance. I was from Colombia, mm -hmm. my family immigrated to Canada, and as the son of, 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 of an immigrant, it was important for you to have a proper career. So, you know, I thought, what do I want to do? So I went to the University of Toronto and I was studying sciences, and then from there I went to chiropractic school, but this entire time, all I wanted to do was was dance, and it wasn't until I took a year from chiropractic school, uh, I took a, a sabbatical and decided, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna dance, I have to go where the best are at, and that's lo and behold, I came to New York City, and and uh, you know, 30 years later, here we are. <laughs> you started dancing at 19 or 20, which that's is correct, fairly yeah. late, yeah. and your career is bookended between Jerome Robbins, Broadway, and Fosse, those nine years as a dancer. And those two choreographers uh, influenced you in what way? Well, first and foremost, I mean, to be able to dance the works of these two legends, these two iconic director choreographers, you know, I know that it had a lot of influence. I mean, even though I was dancing in it, I was always paying attention. You know, Robbins was a chameleon of sorts. Mm -hmm. You know, he never, he, it, for him, it was important to create the world, the vocabulary that was. That was and it was and it had to be specific to the story. Fosse was a was a concept man. He was a he was a a, a man of, of of great great conceit. Pippin, you know, Pippin mm -hmm. was successful until you know when 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 Bob Fosse took over took over Pippin, you know, he created this great concept. So, you know, to for me to be able to to dance their their choreography, to be able to live it, breathe it, and understand it, it was like going on to getting your masters. And, and, and direction and choreography by, by really being in these shows. What's fascinating is that you describe Robbins as a chameleon. You describe, obviously, a very distinct signature for Fosse. Where do you fit in in that spectrum in your own choreography? I think, you know, subconsciously, you take, of course, the inspiration from all these great men and you make, you know, you make do from what you've learned. You know, I think in, in the process of what I do, I think for me it's really important to, first and foremost, understand I understand the story that we're trying to tell. What I love to do is I love to research. I love to be able mm -hmm. to, to really immerse myself in, in the period, whatever that period is, in the characters, in the culture. I mean, I've gone to great lengths. Like uh, about uh, 50, uh, over 15 years ago, I was doing Sound of Music at Stratford Festival, and we were doing Sound of Music. And I thought, you know, I want to study Austrian folk dance. Uh -huh. So, and back then we didn't have the YouTube and all of that, and I researched it everywhere, and I found this one gentleman who taught Austrian folk dance in, in, uh, in down in Southern California, and I went and I studied <laughs> with him because I wanted to use some of it in the show. So for me, it's very important to find the world, the language, how the characters move, and I feel like that is what 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 uh, Robbins inspired in me. I think what Fosse inspired in me. And, and, and the way that I, that when I, when I recall f anything that has to do with thought is like the specificity, mm -hmm. the, the, the real, the attention to detail. 
you know, I allow the dance, my dancers to be, to breathe life into the material. But at the end of the day, I want it to be very specific. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the thing, you know, with Fosse, it was just, you know, everything was very specific. The way you held your cigarette, the way you carried yourself, all of those things I think have great, have had great inspiration in, in my work. If I may, uh, the signature, your signature appears to be the uh, expert ability to marry dance to story and character, as you just described. And in terms of, say, Ain't Too Proud, Even Summer, Jersey Boys, and On Your Feet, you describe a world in which they go from the street to great success. How do you graph that arc in dance? Jersey Boys is a, is a really good example because there were many opportunities in Jersey Boys where I could have shown off. When I first started researching, the period and uh, in the time of the where the four seasons were really coming up, and I thought, you know, these are really blue-collared men, mm. and they can look like the Temptations. They mm -hmm. can look like the Four Tops. The audience has to feel as though they are rooting for these blue-collar guys trying to make it. So it was very important to use restraint. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole show, and the other thing with Jersey Boys was that they didn't dance. The mm -hmm. guys did not dance. They just stood and sang. So, you know, I took departures from their life and created a very iconic choreography, but it used a lot of restraint. And then I understood, also understood that, you know, in order for us to see and root for them, we had to see, we had to see them evolve, you know, as we were watching this, this story. The same thing with Gloria, the same thing with Ain't Too Proud as well. You know, more Ain't Too Proud is a little different because, you know, I've, I've been waiting to do a show like Ain't Too Proud for 20 years because I've been doing <laughs> research of, you know, from the 50s to, to now. And I was just get you know, just, you know, just like I was like a, like a, like a cult, you know, just ready to race. So this one was really more about allowing myself to just be and, and use all of the knowledge that I had Mm -hmm. to create the world and the characters. The world of Jersey Boys was doo-wop, at least originally. So was there a lot of conversation that you had with the musical director, as well as Des, in terms of where to start and where to finish it, and what to do next after the research, where to go from there? Des and I have a, a I mean, I, I, I adore him, and, and I feel so incredibly, I trust him so much. and. Immediately, that was our first show we did on mm -hmm. uh, Jersey Boys. We, there's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of, you know, we, we go through the script. Mm -hmm. uh, every night, even before we start rehearsals, we, we prepare, but then every night before, like uh, after we finish rehearsals, usually from like six to nine or 10 o'clock at night, we sit and we go through 10 pages and we plan what we're gonna do the next day. And so I know if there's a scene that is being staged, but then choreography and dance takes over. I know exactly where dance is beginning. We've had the conversations. We've talked about where the characters are at that point in time emotionally. We've Ron Melrose as well, who's a great collaborator of ours as well. You know, we all, and so sometimes I even stay in rehearsals after like 10 or even 11 because I have to figure out exactly, even though I've researched and it's all planned, but then I really have to cement what the idea will be for the next day. And it's all story driven. It's all story driven. Where is the story at this point? And yeah, absolutely, 100%. And does it include just uh, an actor crossing the stage? Well, let's say it's outside of dance, but does Des ever say, Sergio, I've got to get him from this point A to point B or C. Can you help me out on that? Yeah, does that but, happen? Yeah, I mean, usually what happens is we plan and then he just lets me go. But we've had enough conversations that I'm not going to stray from the path in which we're on. And, and that's another th wonderful thing about Des is and he's such a strong collaborator and a phenomenal, you know, I mean, in terms of directors, I mean, he's one of the best and it's because he's very clear about the direction in which he wants to lead his entire team. So there's never, there's a lot of trust. There's mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of creative trust. And, but we've done the research, we've done the work, we've done the preparation to know exactly which way, when the character's gonna cross, how he's gonna cross, and if he dances, or if he has a look, or if he has a stop, that's all very, very specific, and that has been, has been pretty much prepared and, 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 and directed. And you're also in collaboration with the lighting designer, the set designer, and you know every move that they're making as well, and how they can help you get what you want. You know, I, I, was, I was spoiled. So the first show that I ever did, which didn't come to Broadway, was Mambo Kings. Mm -hmm. Peggy Eisenhower and, and Jules Fisher were the lighting mm -hmm. designers who are probably, 
the best of the best. And um, I remember we began rehearsals and we were in tech rehearsals and, and they were lighting one of my big dance numbers which was Ron Kan Kan and it was all told through dance. It was all dance, all storytelling. And <clears throat> they lit the number and I watched it and I wasn't happy with it. But you know, what do you say to Peggy and Jules? You're like, I hate the number, you know, you can't. <laughs> but they saw it, they saw that I wasn't <laughs> happy and they came up to me and he said, we know you're not happy we'll come in tomorrow morning and we'll relight it. Uh -huh. So we spend the entire morning relighting my entire number. From then on, you know, I got this sort of the, <laughs> the carp launch. I think the strongest collaboration that I have next to Des, Des with, or my director is that of the lighting designer. Interesting. Yeah, as the choreographer, you know, I am the sort of the cinematographer at times because I sort of tell, move people where we need them to, mm -hmm. you know, for the audience to focus. Well. You know, the light with the lighting designer, I need him to understand where I need the focus to go to. Right. And know? they're sculpting with bodies. They're Always, sculpting yeah. bodies yeah. with the light. Yeah, and it's the relationship that I actually love the most. In terms of character, in terms of, of pinning dance to your characters, what is it about the dances that you created for John Lloyd Young as Frankie Valley, as opposed to the screw up played by Christian Hoff? Uh, how does that express itself in dance? John Lloyd was not a dancer. Mm -hmm. So when, before he got hired, I said to the producers, if John is going to play Frankie, I have to spend at least four weeks in a studio with him before we start rehearsals. Wow. And I spent four weeks not only doing dance with him, but also training him. Over here at Manhattan Plaza, we used to go swimming so that because I needed him to get in shape for the part. Um, so the thing with, and with, uh, with John Lloyd was that, you know, it became like, like, like a coach of sorts. And I became so incredibly protective of him. And, and you know, I, there needed to be a real innocence to the character, to Frankie Valli. I needed to see his growth. As a matter of fact, one of the most beautiful moments I've ever experienced watch, was his reaction. The first time we ever did the show in front of an audience, after the, the, what we called the medley, the, the, the Sherry, the girls don't cry and walk like a man, and watching John Lloyd's face just light up and almost tear up because he could not, and, I, and you know, that was a real great deal of satisfaction, but his performance, his movement was very, very restrained, very reserved. Of course, you know, Tommy DeVito, you know, Tommy mm. DeVito, I mean, come on, he's, you know, he's the ego of the show, you know. It was also, I had Christian Hoff was a great mover, so, you know, I had to craft John Lloyd's movement, even, even to like the way he buttoned his jacket. It mm -hmm. was all choreographed, like when mm -hmm. he did it, when he undid it, how he flipped it, all of those things. With, with, with Christian, you know, it was really just about showing off. And, I, you know, I had Christian on my fingertips, so it was great. When Des cast John Lloyd Young, were you convinced and confident you could get him there to where he needed to be? I think, I think one of the things about being be going to school and studying chiropractic was you know that there is mm. a there is a nurturing part of your character you know because you know if you're if you're a chiropractor or if you're a doctor you know you you have this thing about taking care of people right that is what you're signed up for and so I had a real you know I knew that if I push him it was almost like I was you know tough love I used to a lot of tough love with him but I knew he also had the the ambition and he had the focus to do it so yeah when you're in an audition situation, and obviously you're sitting at the table with the director, the choreographer, everybody else, the casting director, when do you say no? Because obviously actors have to be triple threats now, and the guy can be, or the woman can be perfect for the role, can't dance, can't move. How do you judge whether you can get them there or when you think they can't get there? I walk around the room and I really watch the people, the way that people behave, the way that people approach learning the material, the way that they interact with other people, and you learn so much by that because, you know, it's not only about being a triple threat, it's not only being about getting the choreography right away, but there is a character study that you have to do because, yeah. you know, you know, we want a company that is positive, that is constructive, that they're there to, you know, to work hard. And, you know, there's been times where, you know, when I do that study where I've seen the person and, and I've maybe, you know, if, and, I, and, I, you know, and some people are great auditioners, by the way. There are some people that really know how to audition, you know, but it takes, it takes experience. It takes, it takes really cold, like really running auditions to really understand like when you say no. And, and sometimes, you know, there are people who are so talented, so talented, but they're just that one thing. And, yeah. and, and lo and behold, you know, some, you know sometimes, you, you know, you're right. 
When you're doing, uh, when you're choreographing a number for any of the shows that you've been involved with, you're, you're a science major or uh, you have a science degree, you're also a chiropractor, you know what the body can do. How do you convince uh, dancers or actors to go beyond what they think they can do? Well, you know, interesting enough, when you asked me that question, you know, yesterday I had uh, uh, my dance captains over to my place. We were after, we're after rehearsals, we were just for drinks because we're working so hard. And you're rehearsing on what show? Uh, I'm doing Summer right now, the tour of Summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And, uh, and, and uh, a couple of my other, my associates came as well, and they were telling me that I had been tough on some of the dancers. And, you know, the thing that I do is I, I demand a lot, I ask a lot of myself. I ask, I demand a lot of myself. But I also ask a lot of the people that I work with because I believe that the people that we hire for these shows are the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is really somebody pushing them from the, for them to be able to, to, to go beyond what it is that they've been doing. And it takes that one person and I feel like, you know, musical theater is a, is a, is a sacred art. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I want to make sure that, that we continue to respect it. I don't want the art to be, to get diluted, to, to dissipate, you know. It is, you know, it's my responsibility, like it was Jerome Robbins and Fosse and Susan Stroman and Jerry Mitchell and Andy Blank and Bill Rick, Andrew, all of us together, we have to make sure that this sanctified art for continues to pervade and do what it does, inspire it and push people beyond anything that they can do. And, and with uh, Ain't Too Proud, you had Eddie Kendricks uh, and you had a from Sykes. One of them was an Alvin, Alvin Ailey dancer, mm -hmm. right? Which one was the Alvin Ailey dancer? Ephraim, Ephraim Sykes. Ephraim Sykes was an Alvin. And Eddie Kendricks didn't have much dance experience. Jeremy is that, Pope, yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Um, and so how do, you, how do you, again, get him to the place, and I think he worked very, very hard. I think uh, you had said that before. How did you get him to into that groove, into that zone that he had to be in? So Jeremy, we got in a room and we danced, and I thought, okay, I, you know, he might be able to do it. He's very contemporary. Mm -hmm. Can I get him to get away from the hip hop thing? You know, can I get him to understand the period? Uh, and uh, that's the thing with Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy is very ambitious, you mm -hmm. know, very focused, very ambitious, um, and works hard. So it's like a tailor, really. Uh -huh. You know, you take the measurements and you look at the body and you say, okay, well, you know, maybe he's got long legs, so you know, this is what I need to do to make sure. You know, it's it's exactly it's exactly that. It's really understanding the character, the actor, his talents, his his shortcomings, and his you know, and his uh, and his attributes, and and you figure out exactly how to make that work, especially in a show like the, like, like Into Proud. When you're dealing with period, obviously, period musicals, whether it's summer in the, you know, 60s, and well, into the 70s, really, and On Your Feet, which is the 80s, uh, Ain't Too Proud, which I guess is 60s into 70s, to what extent are you faithful to the period? To what extent do you want to add a 2019 gloss to the dance? We're not recreating the, the temptations, we're not recreating the period, we're doing a, an adaptation of it. So we really have to look at it through the lens of today. Mm -hmm. And that means really me looking at dance and saying, you know, can I do, like in Jersey Boys, I was like, can I do the twist, but can I do it with a twist? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can I do the mashed potato, but can I do it with a, with a twist of a mashed potato? You know, it's those things, you know, so taking, watching the, the temptations and the, and the work and really saying, you know, how do I, how do I maximize that? How do I take what we know in dance, what we know in theater, and and, and their story, and 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 also I had my, you know, I had Ephraim Sykes, Jeremy mm -hmm. Pope, Darren Baskin, James Harkness, and and Joanne Jackson. These great, incredibly talented triple threads. Yeah. You know, they're doing things that the actual <laughs> temps would never do. So you know, that was you know, that's all of the things that came into my head as I was doing all of this, and and I continue to work on the show to the end, you know, it's yeah. like, and I'm gonna add one more thing. You know, it's like maximizing the opportunity. You have an opportunity to say yes to any number of projects. How do you pick your projects? And I think people would be surprised that you picked Next to Normal. Didn't have a lot of dance in it, and you had come from a lot of dance. Uh, is it the people that you wanted to work with that led to that choice? Yeah, you know, I- And the I, story, perhaps. Yes, of course. I, I've been very fortunate that I've had some great, wonderful opportunities, uh, some, some wonderful projects that have come my way. And, you know, 
I, I, I always have to take, there's always, I have to have to, have a, to be a lesson. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and sometimes the things that scare me are the things that I mm. need to do. Uh, I wanted to work with Michael Greif. I wanted to work with Brian Yorkey and I had worked together on a show before, way before that. Tom Kidd is so incredibly talented and David Stone, you know, he's a wonderful, incredibly, you know, talented producer. So when you look at that, you know, you look at the team and you say, and then, and then, you know, the show that, that, the first show that we got was not actually the show that ended up on stage, but you know, you sort of have to look beyond all of that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, in terms of On Your Feet, Mambo Kings, uh, perhaps Arabal to some extent, and, um, and you know, other productions, they're very personally close to you. Obviously, as you mentioned earlier, you're from Cali, Colombia. Yeah. You have the immigrant experience of having, uh, having moved with your family for a better life in Toronto first, and then coming to this country. How has your immigrant experience, Sergio, uh, influenced your dance, influenced your style? I spent the first 10 years, and probably 20 years of my career, and my choreographic career those 10 years, um, working on shows that were very American. You know, Memphis, Jersey Boys, Adam's Family, Next to Normal, Tarzan, on and on and on and on. And I hadn't gotten close to, you know, to who I really was. And I hadn't, you know, I sort of like had put that, that, that sort of part of my life in a, in a sort of, in a, in, a, in, a, in a very special place. After I finished Adam's Family in Memphis, that year I remember thinking, you know, I really need to dig in. I really need to really go back to my roots. And, and I think I was so focused on, on, on moving, you know, on, on moving ahead and, and the future that it wasn't like, now I feel like my life is richer because I've actually really embraced who I am, who I was, my past. Um, you know, it hasn't been easy. You know, the immigrant story that I've lived is, is, a, is a fully lived one with sacrifices, obstacles. And, you know, my, at the end of the day, you know, this journey has to mean something. And not, has to mean something not for me, but for those who will come after me. And, um, you know, I take this moment and this, my career and my life very, very significantly because I want to make sure that I do leave a trace of, 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 of what I did an imprint on, on others who will come after me. And that richness in your experience and that richness of embrace, embracing your past has, expended, has extended to your dances as well. I mean, it, it well, becomes yeah. a part of it because yeah. it's so much a part of the DNA. Yeah, well, thank you. So, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, I think what, I, what I've learned to trust as well is, uh, you know, that the, the, the sounds, you know, you're growing up and you hear in Colombia, you know, we lived in a not so rich, no, actually in a very poor little uh, neighborhood, but there was always music. Mm -hmm. You know, even if people were screaming, crying, at the end of the day, there was always music and there was always dance. And so I think that for me, there is always this joy, you know, this, mm -hmm. this sort of, I carry this joy that is very much ingrained in me. And, and even to this day, my family, you know, wherever, whenever I go home or when there was a party, you know, lo and behold, there's always a dance off. There's always a salsa dance off. They're always trying to show up who who does the best steps. I actually don't dance anymore around them because it's like you know, it's like I have to I have to like always practice before I go there. So no, so it's I think it's a, is that that part of it that I carry very 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 deep in me and that really has helps my work. The, the joy, really. The joy and the sexiness yeah. as well. I, you yeah. can't discount the, the Latino sexiness at all. You brought that joy and, and that emotion to your Tony speech, in which you delivered a message uh, to anybody that comes, to dreamers particularly. And I'd like you to sort of, uh, to go back to that moment in the Tony Awards, because it was one of the high points and emotional moments of the Tony Awards of, of last year. Is this something that you had prepared and consequently felt that you wanted to express in this moment in our country's life? Yeah. Talking about coming to this country as an undocumented immigrant and all that stuff has always been something that I wasn't sure that I wanted to share. You know, there is always that culture. There is always, there's a slight shame that you're doing something wrong when you're really not. You've come here to live for seeking a better life. I came here to, to become a Broadway dancer, like, you know, to really, for, for, to achieve my dreams, really, as corny as that may sound, but it's true. 
Patrick, I don't think that had and this I had I had this moment ten years ago, winning a Tony Award, and to voiced that, that nobody would have understood what I was talking about. Um, those alive. 90 seconds to needed to mean something, uh, not only for the people that have helped me get here and helped me. You know, it wasn't just the team. The that, angels. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, un incredible angels. I mean, I've had such so much love and support from the community and people who helped me when I first got here. You know, at, at the beginning as well. But at the end of the day, too, I, you know, how do you, like, you use that moment as a platform, and as a platform to inspire others who are watching and witnessing this moment. And for me, it was important to un for the dreamers to understand that they need it, they need to hold on, you know, in, in, in moments of, 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 of great, of, of, of challenges like this, you know, it's important to continue to believe, to dream, to hope, because it will change. Things will change, and um, and 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 I and I and I, and I, and I yeah, was I, you know I'm a, I'm a, I'm an example of of if given the the opportunity, given the support, given the love, you know what can happen to these young kids. You know some of them it's just like you know they're so incredibly talented they're just not getting that opportunity. Well, you're giving lots of people opportunities. I'm glad you got the opportunities to enrich us. So thank you very much for spending time with us. It's a remarkable story. Thank you. You know, I, it means a great deal to me that you took the time to talk to me. I'm, I'm a huge fan, and more than anything, I, I do. I want to continue to make sure that, uh, that, that this, this moment is, is, is heard. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next month with another look at the expert and singular artists who live and work only to astonish us. I'm Patrick Pacheco.